with Transformation, a serialized podcast by Alison Witt. Chapter 3 The Cat's Meow. Once upon a time, there was a fancy man who laid down magical beats thrum and pulse, thrum and pulse. The beats would ripple across the ground and burrow into the feet and heads of those who came to feel and hear him. Around the bonfire, into the fog, the feet would dance and follow the man. Their mouths would grin and laugh and sing. One day, a particularly fancy lady came to see the magical man make his beats. Her laugh shot into the air like a firework. Her smile lit like floodlights on a football field. She could not sing. Her voice was as melodious as a fox crying over a locked garbage bin. Perhaps that's what caught his attention. The fancy pair knew it was a match, so they married immediately. Together they swept off to the most spectacular locations. Lake Como in Italy, Montenegro, Tokyo. They bought a terrace house in London, the city that made both their hearts sing. He played his beats. She had a well-being multimedia channel and was sent lavish gifts. Everything from dresses to smoothie makers. When their daughter was born, their circle of stardom was complete. The magazines paid thousands for a five-page spread. The beats went on. The wheels on the tarmac flew up and down. Then one night, the fancy beat maker didn't come home. While his people packed up his speakers and deck from the beach, he walked down to the water's edge. His clothes were there in the morning. He was gone. The fancy lady locked all the doors and closed the shutters, held her young child close. But the flashes popped outside her window like a different kind of firework. The doorknob rattled. The shouts came day and night, demanding answers to unanswerable questions. Help came from a different kind of magic man, one gifted with the sleight of hand, of smoke screens, diversions. Under a cloud of fog, he transported the fancy lady and her daughter away. London was no longer a friend. Had it ever truly been? There was a home in Devon, under her maiden name. But after a couple of days, the media circus came to town, and it was the same. Flash. Rattle. Shout. Drastic action was called for. The magic man helped again. But this time they went up to Dublin. The fancy lady's strong nose was given a generic touch. Her jawline became square. Mother and daughter were given new papers. An elaborate money diversion scheme was concocted. He had found a place, he told them. On the other side of the world. Where no one would look for them where people looked for news no further than their own backyards. They would be safe there. And they had been. Sort of. I awoke on Monday to the feeling of something flat and hard wedged between my cheek and the pillow. Lifting my head, there was a peeling sound like sticky tape being torn off a roll. I blinked, registered something shiny, then blinked again. No. It wasn't your magnificent machine. I'd fallen asleep on my phone. I pressed the refresh button, illuminating the screen. A puddle of drool had accumulated between the V and the M on the virtual keyboard. Hick. Ignoring the queasy clench of my stomach, I yanked a tissue from the box beside my bed and wiped the glass clean. I wish I could have done the same with my mind. I was seriously losing it. The state of the bed told the full story. My legs were enmeshed with bedclothes, an angry snarl of fitful tossing and dampened memories. The dreams of the previous night backwashed into my brain. It was as though someone had stretched out the years of my life into a reel of film, attacked it with scissors, and rearranged the memories to only show highlights of the bad bits. I sat up and shook it all out. Arms, torso, head. It wasn't important anymore. It was all in the past. The old ginger was gone. Cat and I were safely hidden away. Or were we? I unlocked my phone and navigated back to the point where I crashed out last night. Terry's magnificent machine. What could it mean? Do you know the internet is filled with information about you? I hadn't looked for a while. 
I hadn't wanted to. But I'm amazed I didn't accidentally stumble upon you more often. Wikipedia sums up your life in a couple of sentences. Terence Maurice Jones was, was, see dad, you had the whole world fooled, was a British record producer and DJ, primarily active in London and Brighton. Jones migrated to Bristol, England, from Trinidad with his parents when he was 10. He was accepted into the University of Bristol to study physics, but dropped out at age 21 when he had his first commercial dance hit, See My Booty Bang, a song he created using software on his computer. There were pictures of you and Kat in your younger days, all glammed up, the proverbial meow, attending the latest London club opening, the Brit Awards, the sizzliest of the sizzling film premieres. Your record sales are there, all the platinum, gold, silver and bronze records, the artists under your label, Starbright Records of One, are still winning. The royalties of your number one hit, Dance Like You're Dislocated, pay for Cats in My House here in Bottlenose Beach. It's nothing special, nothing to draw too much attention, but it's big and it's light and it's airy. They call them McMansions over here. Everyone has one. Throughout all the news articles, there's no mention of a machine. I tried to picture in my head what kind of machine a record producer might possess to elevate it to magnificent. My earliest memories involve rooms filled with buttons, slide controls and flashing panels. Back then, they all seemed pretty fabulous to me. I swung over the side of the bed and grabbed my backpack. I pulled out the scrunched up note and read it for the gazillionth time. Why would someone do this to me? Was I a part of some elaborate reality TV show? Did Denny put me in for prank patrol? I peered into the glassy eyes of Star Bear. Remember him? That chintzy fairground prize bear your record company used to give out? I never got around to throwing out the one you gave me. I looked for signs of a hidden camera, but if there was one, it was pretty well hidden. If Danny had entered me into prank patrol, and it wasn't unthinkable, he did like a laugh, he wouldn't have used you. Danny was the only friend who knew about my life before Bottlenose Beach. He'd heard enough to know any reminder of you was no joke, but that led me to wonder who else could possibly know about us. My phone beeped, and I leapt about a foot in the air. Speak of the devil. It was from Danny. Yo, G, where are you? Bus in five. Chinese today. Nom nom. What? A quick glance at the time confirmed things. I was seriously late. I tore down the stairs, plucked an almost dry shirt from the clothesline and pulled it on, then rummaged through the hamper until I found a skirt that passed the sniff test. Yep, that's me. Your daughter's a grot. The only sign that Kat had been and gone was a coffee-splattered mug on the bench top. A note leaned awkwardly against the cup, obscuring my mother's favourite mantra, but I knew it so well I pictured the words anyway. Turn the page and read on. See what you've done? The woman is a walking wellness retreat. When I opened the note, I saw that Kat's hastily scrawled message was along the usual lines. She'd gone off to yoga and I'd have to sort out my own breakfast. I grabbed an apple from the fridge, breakfast and an emergency toothbrush in one, and headed out the door just in time to see the bus rumble past. My shoulders dropped, then tensed because as the bus moved out of my full view, I spied a shiny grey VW parked across the street. Standing next to it was the magic man himself. He smiled and shook a brown paper bag, a Sicilian muffin with lemon curd centre, my all-time favourite and hard to come by around here. A cream-filled lamington was about as exotic as you could hope for at the local bakery. Do you need a lift somewhere? he asked as we watched the bus amble off into the distance. It was official. The note about the machine? Mr Bell's sudden appearance? Something was definitely Dodge in the town of Bottlenose Beach. 